All right, so this controversy between India and Canada going on for uh, over a week now. Uh, in fact, it's going to be a couple of weeks now uh, since the Canadian Prime Minister made those very dramatic and public allegations about Indian intelligence being behind the assassination of uh, Hardeep Nijjar. India, of course, has rejected those allegations. The Foreign Minister speaking uh, in the United Nations, as well as subsequent uh, meetings that he's had uh, in the United States, suggesting that uh, both privately and publicly, no specific evidence has been shared so far with India. Uh, and if it was, then India is willing to take action. Joining me now is Mr. Ward Elcock. He served as the Director of Canadian Security Intelligence Services from 1994 to 2004. He was the longest serving uh, Director of uh, Canadian Intelligence. He also went on to become Deputy Minister of National Defence. Thank you very much, Mr. Elcock, for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. First things first, uh, in the world of intelligence, uh, when, when there is so much secrecy shrouded around it, uh, this kind of public accusations, a prime minister of a country standing up in parliament and making public accusations against another country, uh, would that be considered normal or would it be odd? Um, uh, when you first look at it, one would probably say that it is odd, but having said that, uh, the circumstances themselves are odd. It's not very often uh, that a country stands accused of having carried out an assassination. A democratic country is accused of carrying out an assassination in another country and as i understand it uh, although i'm obviously not involved and wasn't party to any of the discussions the government of canada has said on a number of occasions that it sought to have discussions uh, with the indian government before the prime minister made his statement um, but uh, didn't make any progress in those discussions with the indian government uh, and i guess the other comment i would make <coughs> is that apparently it, um, there were considerable rumors within the community here already uh, in some press uh, coverage of, of, of that and of other possible leaks uh, that uh, uh, were about to come out um, that would probably have forced the issue onto the public stage in any case. Mr. Elcock, the words that were used by the Canadian Prime Minister were credible allegations. Uh, just help us traverse that distance between what is an allegation and what may be considered as evidence. Evidence that obviously, uh, in this case, it's a case of murder, uh, has to stand the test of law, has to stand up in a court of law. What it, I mean, how, how does one traverse that distance? Because so far, we've not seen any evidence. All we've heard is what the Prime Minister said, credible allegations. Well, intelligence often is not sometimes never transformed into, into evidence, uh, in some cases uh, because governments are unwilling even to admit that they have the intelligence and to put it before a court even if they know the information to be true. Um, the reality is knowing the capacity of the system and the intelligence that I've seen over the past, um, I have no reason to believe that the intelligence the Prime Minister has referred to is inaccurate. Uh, when you say intelligence seldom translates into evidence for, for various reasons, like you said, governments are unwilling uh, to reveal the nature of that intelligence because it might compromise sources and so on. Uh, but what are we typically looking at? Are we looking at chatter of diplomats? Are we looking at uh, you know, encrypted messages being decoded? What, 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 what typically would construe as intelligence which leads to these you know, credible allegations of potential Indian involvement? It could be any of those things. Um, uh, it could also include human sources. Uh, it could include a number of things. Um, um, given that the government has been so clear uh, in, its, uh, in its position, the Canadian government has been so clear in its position, it is uh, likely that there are multiple sources of intelligence um, it would be extraordinarily rare for uh, any uh, Canadian agency or, or indeed the government to proceed on the basis of a single source of reporting. Uh, so that would say to me that there were certainly more, more than three, but how many other sources of intelligence, I don't know, but certainly multiple sources. Uh, if it has to lead to the conclusion 
that there were certain Indian officials uh, who were based in some of the missions there in Canada involved, either directly or indirectly, in the murder of Hardeep Nijar. Again, what is the distance that must be traversed uh, for that to stand up in a court of law? Because it's a pretty big accusation to make. Uh, the reality is, it seems to me, uh, that these kinds of accusations are not things that are ever going to be tried in a court of law. Uh, they're really things that have to be settled at an intergovernmental level. Um, uh, and I think the Canadian government at this point um, has, while it, it has taken the position that it would like to meet with the Indians on the subject, uh, so far the Indian government has taken a position which seems to be much more um, uh, like a distraction uh, strategy rather than an attempt to address the issue. So multiple Indian government officials, including the foreign minister uh, speaking uh, last week in his various engagements in the United States on the sidelines of the UNGA and his meetings in Washington, has said that if anything specific is shared by Canada, then India will look into it and India will fully cooperate. Uh, what does that mean to you? Uh, does it mean that so far Canada has not shared anything that can be acted upon by the Indian side? Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what what the Indian view of what they, how they would like to proceed is, frankly. Um, I, I think the signal that I have seen to the extent that, and both of us are looking at it from the outside rather than from the inside, uh, the government uh, of Canada, I think, has uh, suggested that that uh, the Indians, while they may be saying they're willing to uh, look at any information that's provided, they're not willing to sit down and have a discussion of the issue. The other curious part about this story was, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Nijar's son uh, coming out and speaking to Canadian media this week and where he revealed uh, that his father had regular meetings with Canadian intelligence officials, sometimes once or twice a week, in the days leading up to his death. And yet, uh, there is other reporting which suggests that Mr. Nijar was alone at the time that he died. Uh, if his life was indeed under threat, and if he was having these multiple meetings in the weeks leading up to his death with Canadian intelligence officials, why wasn't he given any kind of protection? Uh, it the service wouldn't, in any case, have provided protection. It would have been provided, uh, presumably, by a police agency, certainly not by the service. Uh, I can't speak to the the, the um, uh, truthfulness of, of the claims of Mr. Nijar's son, um, and there could be many reasons why uh, the service might meet with someone, starting from uh, the point of view that, that, given the nature of our country as an immigrant country, uh, the service does uh, maintain contacts with individual, a wide range of individuals within the various communities across Canada uh, for a variety of reasons, in many cases to listen rather than for any other reason. Uh, there is at least a public indication in this country that um, CSIS ha may have provided some information to Mr. Nijar that, that he was facing some kind of threat. Uh, but I have no idea what the level of that threat was seen to be or how imminent it was seen to be or whether that was or what point that was provided. Doesn't it also strike to you as odd that if Mr. Nijar was having these multiple meetings with Canadian intelligence officials, he was, after all, so someone who had an Interpol red corner notice against him. Uh, my understanding is any signatory to the Interpol is bound to take some sort of legal action uh, if they come into contact with someone against whom there is a red corner notice. The service is, does not have any police powers, uh, so uh, it is entirely an intelligence collector. Um, if there were any action to be taken, uh, that would be for the RCMP to, to take that action. And, and frankly, uh, that would depend um, on the nature of the information provided. Um, there are more than a few red notices out there that are, are to say the least, suspect. Uh, so simply issuing a red notice doesn't mean that somebody is, is in fact going to be arrested. All right, and one final word. In your long years in service, and especially as Director of Canadian Intelligence, uh, have you come across 
any such case involving Canada and any other foreign government or country uh, where, you know, such public back and forth was happening? Uh, no, this is, I think, uh, the most serious case that, that, that I have seen. Uh, I can recall other cases, but they don't rise to the level uh, uh, of this case. Um, um, there, were, uh, there have been over the years cases where people have alleged one country or another is spying on the other, but uh, I'm not aware of any other instance where uh, a country has uh, carried out an assassination in Canada. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Alcock, for speaking with us, uh, the former head of Canadian intelligence, uh, saying that it's rare that such accusations are being made uh, in public, and B, uh, what the Canadian government has now are credible allegations uh, based on intel, and that rarely ever uh, translates into evidence uh, in a court of law. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Uh, news and updates continue right here.